I just showed up. And it's so good to see that you showed up today. Happy to have all of you this morning. God bless you. It's a beautiful day. I love the second service crowd. I mean, I don't have anything against that first service crowd, but you are more alert, more awake. I understand that, too. I understand that. I feel their pain. I really do. I'm so glad you're here today. Now, I don't know if I'm getting too old for this trifecta of preaching and teaching Sunday school and then coming back preaching again. It's kind of a preacher's version of a triathlon, and uh, I don't know if I'm getting too old for that or not. I'll let you know around noon. I got to tell you, I'm fading fast. I better preach fast because I'm fading fast. I thought of just tweeting my message in. But that, that tweeting business doesn't seem to be working too well on some front, so I, I'm here. Here I am, alive and in person, up close and personal, and I'm here to preach. I'm here to preach today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want to preach about the will of God in end-time attitudes in regard to in regards to the fulfilling of God's will for our lives. First Thessalonians chapter five. I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open to that text because we're going to be examining its context. That's always important. Uh, but for our purposes now we just simply want to read verses sixteen through eighteen of chapter five. First First Thessalonians chapter five. Be joyful always. Okay, I've already hit a snag. How about you? <laughs> it's that little word always that he had to throw that in there, but he did. Be joyful always. Pray continually. There he goes again. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God. How important is it? Well, it's all important. In fact, nothing, nothing could be more important. Now, I would not be so presumptuous to tell you what God's will for you is, aside from His revealed will in His Word. Paul, an apostle of Christ, says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's very concerned about the will of God, that we know it and we do it. So first of all, I'd like to look at the message of God's will. Beginning with verse 12 of this chapter, Paul gives some 20 rapid-fire admonitions with words of action and personal responsibility. It's really quite a package, and it's all wrapped up in the ribbon of verse 18, this is God's will for you. Now, we only have time to look in the immediate neighborhood of this assertion, but we find plenty there to think about. First of all, my friend, it's God's will for us to be joyful. Verse 16, be joyful always. Verse 17, this is God's will for you. Now, I, I can have joy, and sometimes tremendous joy, to the point you would think I was on something. Pastor Weaver can be so joyful, you think he should be on something. But Admittedly, and I think he would share this opinion, admittedly, the hard part is to be joyful always. And yet I know it's possible to do that. You see, if it is God's will, God makes a way. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, Paul has set the example in this matter. He's already shown the way and led the way. He has exemplified the very challenge that he presents to us. Can you imagine being told to cheer up by a man 
who was a known whiner and complainer. He'd be laughed off the stage or from behind the pulpit, and, and rightly so. I mean, that's, that's be like Bobby Knight giving lessons on anger management. It just doesn't work. Paul doesn't preach what he doesn't practice. In every epistle, he speaks of his joy, and most of those letters were written from a filthy dungeon where he ended up after public humiliation and vicious beating. And he says, be joyful always. As soon as we hear that, the protests begin. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. I know. You're right. I don't know. But I know what Paul went through. I know about his life of unbelievable suffering, a suffering he documents in every one of his epistles, certainly in this one. If you go back to chapter 2 and note in verse 1, he says, You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. And drop down to verse 15, that same chapter. He speaks of those who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. And in chapter 3 and in verse 2, Paul says, We sent Timothy, who was our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. Suffering, insults, opposition, trials, persecution. How was your day? And yet... His joy is always in the forefront. In chapter 2 and verse 20, you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3, verse 9, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? I can't think of anyone in the Bible who suffered more for the gospel but who also had more joy than the Apostle Paul. Well, there's another example highlighted for us, presented to us in this very text, and, and that's the church itself, the church in Thessalonica. Now, they too were living under attack. They too lived with severe suffering. Paul acknowledges that in chapter 2 and verse 14, for you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. So the church in Judea suffered, and the church here in Thessalonica suffering for the cause of the gospel. And yet their joy is a matter of record. In chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed with joy the message given by the Holy Spirit. So the Christian's joy is nothing like the world's happiness. Happiness is linked to what happens. Joy is independent of what happens. Joy is not linked to circumstances. Joy is linked to Christ and truth and hope that outweighs and outlives the circumstances. I would be suspicious of any church that called itself a Christian church that did not have joy. And I would feel sorry for any person who claimed to be a Christian who didn't have joy. Joy is our privilege and our potential. It's God's will for us. And then Paul says, it's God's will for us 
not only to be joyful, but to be prayerful. In verse 17, we've read, pray continually. Verse 18, this is God's will for you. And as soon as I bring up the matter of prayer, some begin to reason, "Uh uh-oh, here we go again, being reminded that I don't pray enough, just what I need, more guilt, more shame, more despair. Well, listen, I'm part of that club. I got burned out on that a long time ago. Dig deeper, try harder, climb higher, climb, climb, climb. You get to the top of the ladder and you discover it's leaning against the wrong building. I've been subjected to that mentality all my Christian life. You know what I did with it? It's the only thing I could do. I gave up. I absolutely gave up. I gave up trying to live up to everybody's expectations of spirituality. I learned pretty early that people have lists, long lists, and they want to give you their list. By the time you get collecting all the lists, you're about as dizzy as a termite in a yo-yo. You have no idea where to begin. I watered up the list and took out the trash. I gave up trying to please everybody. I gave up trying to outdo myself in spiritual calisthenics. I gave up trying to climb that ladder. When I could not succeed in living up to the lofty goals set by others or myself, I found myself drinking from the bitter cup of despair and defeat and guilt and shame and frustration. On those rare occasions, those short-lived times, when I could live up to my ideals, then I suffered from pride. It's a no-win situation. I remember about 15 years ago, I had a telephone interview with a church, and a deacon asked me, how much do you pray? And it wasn't the question so much as it was the tone of it that I found condescending and a little offsetting. When I tried to give him a generic response, he became even more curt and direct, and he said, I want to know how much do you pray? He wanted the number of minutes or or hours. And he didn't ask me anything about the intimacy of my prayer life or the efficacy of my prayer life or the focus of it. He just wanted a magic number. It was up to me to guess what that magic number was. The amount of time was what was important in his mind. Well, time can be important, but I think quality is more important when it comes to prayer. I don't think God has us on a timer. Only legalistic men would do that. And let me ask you, isn't it possible to maintain an ongoing conversation with the Lord throughout the day? And that's what I told this guy. I explained, look, I've been going on one-hour prayer walks every day, and I'm, I doubt if that counted because I wasn't kneeling. I was walking. And I said, I I guess that adds a certain formality to prayer time, but I try to stay in communion with the Lord throughout the day. Prayer is not something we turn on and turn off. We live in prayer, in communion with the Lord. We walk with Him in a consciousness of His presence and His Lordship in our lives. Prayer is not reporting for duty. It's the byproduct of a relationship. It's as natural as it can be for the believer. So if you want to talk about my prayer life, it has to be done in terms of that relationship, not signing off on some deacon's checklist or anyone else's, quite frankly. Well, as you might suspect, he and I had a mutual loss of interest in getting to know each other better. Prayer is our privilege. It is our joy. It's what we are. It's in our spiritual DNA. It's recognizing whose we are. And it's God's will for us. Be joyful and prayerful. And then thirdly, Paul tells us it's God's will for us 
to be thankful. You noted that in, in verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Well, how many of us should be thankful? Just those that are going through a blessed time, a good season, those who are enjoying prosperity and peace, harmony? No, every one of us. Unless you've been given an exemption, and if you have, please show us your exemption card. Now again, you would remind me, but you don't know what I'm going through, and I would not, I would not diminish that at all. But again, I would remind you what Paul has been through. I don't know everything he went through, but I, I do know enough to know that if he can be thankful after spit and stones and stocks and after hunger and hatred and humiliation, after dungeons and disfigurement and deprivation, surely I'm not off the hook. Surely I can be thankful. There's no worse witness of the Christian faith than a joyless, thankless person. And if that describes you, please don't tell anybody you are a follower of Jesus. Paul was thankful. In fact, he couldn't stop talking about it, talked about it all the time. Couldn't get past the first two verses of this letter without saying, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. And in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? <laughs> One of the healthiest things we can do is to cultivate a spirit of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude. Th thankful people live happier healthier and longer. Grouches don't live longer. It just seems that way. <laughs> it's God's will for you and me to be thankful. So this is the message of God's will. But now we must, we must understand the means for doing God's will because, preacher, I've shown up here and I'm telling you that I, you, we should all be thankful and prayerful and joyful, and so I've just handed you mission impossible. And you're right, it is impossible. We can't do it on our own. And you're hearing this and you're saying, I, come on, man, I need help here. Who's going to help me? I'm all alone out there. No, you're not. Don't think that for a moment. You're not alone anytime, anywhere, any place. You're not alone. Why, you have God the Father working with you. If you'll note that in verse 23, may God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Now, don't forget this God is your Father. In the first verse of the first chapter, Paul calls Him God the Father. And a good Father is always there. He's always there to help. A good father won't let his child be overwhelmed. A good father's not about to set his child up for failure. God the Father gives what He requires from us. He calls and then He fulfills the call in us. In verse 24, Paul declares, The one who calls you is faithful and He will do it. Do what? He'll do it all. He will sanctify you through and through in verse 23. He will help you to do God's will in verse 18. He will do anything and everything He asks of you. Well, you not only have God the Father working in your behalf, but you have, you have the Lord Jesus Christ working with you. Verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He is a helping Jesus. He's not divorced from you in your situation. He's not aloof and aloft in heaven, not cognizant of what you're going through in life, not at all. Well, don't you know he's your traveling companion? He's there to help you. 
Look at him. He's a very active Savior. Chapter 3, verse 11, Paul said, Now may our God and Father himself and our, and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. He's active. He's involved. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May He, he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all His holy ones. You've got God the Father working in your life right now. You have the Lord Jesus Christ superintending the affairs of your life right now orchestrating men and circumstances for your good and His glory. And then you have the Holy Spirit working in you and with you. Did Jesus not say, it's expedient for you that I go away? Did He not say, I will send the paraclete, the one called alongside of, the comforter? Did He not say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you? So no wonder Paul says in verse 19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working in our lives, helping us. We have even more. The little boy was told about the love of God, and he said, but Mama, I want to see love with skin on it. God's given us Love wrapped in skin all around us because we also have the brothers working with us. Paul uses that word brothers repeatedly in his epistles some 15 times in this epistle alone to remind us that we're not alone, that we have a family. Why, look at the family talk here in verse, chapter 5 and verse 25, brothers. Pray for us. Verse 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Verse 27, I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Oh, don't you love that? Don't you thank God for it? Why do we go to church so much? Because we've got family there. We go to church to get away from the joy suckers that surround us, the naysayers, the whiners and complainers, the Debbie Downers, CNN. <laughs> brothers help brothers. Brothers pray for one another. Brothers care for one another. Brothers love one another. The church is not a business. The church is a family. And so we have the message of doing God's will. We have the means for doing God's will. And thirdly, Paul so beautifully presents us with the motivation for doing God's will. Now, this is not the only motivation, but it certainly is one of the more inspiring ones. It's found here in chapter 5, verse 23. The latter part of the verse, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, we used to preach about the second coming of Jesus, we used to preach it about all the time. But then we, I guess we got smarter, we got busy, we got preoccupied, we got worldly, we got infatuated by our own ideas. We begin to look at the coming of Jesus as an unwelcome and inconvenient intrusion. And the message of the second coming has been conveniently forgotten and laid aside. I think it's time to bring it back, and I think it's time to put it front and center. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. I want you to see something. I want you to see that this truth is so real, so big, so important that Paul gives emphasis to the second coming of our Lord in every single chapter of this epistle. He will not end a chapter without bringing focus and highlighting the second coming of Jesus. Look at chapter 1 and verse 10. 
and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Chapter 2, verse 19, for what is our hope? our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when He comes. Chapter 3, verse 13. May He strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all His holy ones. Chapter 4, verse 16, those beloved verses For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with Him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5, at the beginning of the chapter, verse 2, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And in the concluding portion of that chapter, verse 23, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a hope. Hallelujah. Well, our kids are coming here in a few days. My son and his family get here tomorrow night. Daughter shows up a few days later. And uh, we've been getting ready for it. We've begun to prepare. We've made, a, made up a list of things we want to do when they get here. We love showing, up, showing off the finer parts of Des Moines. And we've got a list of places we'd like to go. You know, the essentials. Zombie burger. Uh, uh, tasty taco. We'll play a little tennis, maybe some wiffle ball, go to Adventureland, do some bike ridings. We play hard, we eat hardy. We've cleared the schedule, we've washed the dishes, we've tidied up the house. The kids are coming. The kids are coming! We're getting ready for them. Well, don't forget, Jesus is coming too. Don't forget, Jesus is coming. John Wesley had it right. He said, I try to live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose today, and is coming back tomorrow. Jesus is coming. That's our blessed hope. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Jesus is coming. Don't miss it. Don't forget it. Don't lose sight of it. Jesus is coming. Be thankful. Be prayerful. Be joyful. This is is God's will for you. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you that we are people of hope, not of despair. That our hope's not tied to the headlines. Our hope's not tied to the political party. Our hope is not tied to current events. No, our hope is tied to the ageless Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray, Lord, that there will be no uh, disconnect between our hope and our lives, but that in the context of that glorious anticipation, we will sense a call from You and a lift from You to be those people who are thankful and prayerful and joyful. I think that we're not alone in this holy endeavor, but we have a Father in heaven who is working in our behalf. We have our Savior who ever lives to make intercession in our behalf. We have the Comforter, not only with us, but in us. There is a divine enablement here, a divine energy so that we can do what we can't do, so that we can become what we cannot become in and of ourselves. I pray this morning there will be a release, an instilling of hope, hope that we prevail over all of life's hurts. 
My friend, while your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed, let me tell you, being outside the kingdom of God for 17 years of my life and now inside the kingdom of God, there's no comparison. There's just no comparison. Fleeting moments of happiness and a dab of joy here and there before, but after meeting Jesus, every day is a joy-filled day. Every day is a hope-filled day. Every day is a new opportunity to learn and to grow and to be full of thanksgiving and prayerfulness and joyfulness. Every day there's a forward look and a forward momentum because we know that Jesus could come today, but if He doesn't come today, it might be tomorrow. And if He doesn't come tomorrow, someday He is going to return just like He promised. You can take everything away from me, but one thing you can't touch is that hope. It's on the inside. No one can reach it. It is a God-given gift that is given to every believer. That's why they call us believers. Believe and receive. And today, if you don't have that hope, that wonderful, glorious hope, then you fall prey to the victimization of a world that will have no mercy on you. If you don't have that hope, you're floundering. If you don't have that hope, death takes everything away from you. If you have that hope, nothing can touch you. And if you don't have that hope, my friend, you can make a decision right now. And I'm not trivializing the decision in the light of the mammoth repercussions of that decision. You can make a decision right now to step out of your darkness into His light, out of your bondage into His freedom, out of your despair into His hope. The reason I know that's true is because it's exactly, precisely what happened to me when I was 17 years of age. And when I said yes to God, the floodgates of joy came in, peace came in, love was birthed in my heart. I became a new creation. And if anyone be in Christ, He is a new creation. You can make that decision right now. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hear my voice, open the door, I will come in. And I want to encourage you, urge you with everything within me, every iota of evangelistic fervor within me to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll come back to me and you'll say it's the greatest thing I ever did in my life. You can do that right now. If you do that, I want you to share that good news with somebody. Tell a pastor. Stop at the center and the desk and the foyer. Let them know you've made that decision to follow him.